before the advent of classical magnet schools, you had classical magnet subjects. They would pick your your brightest students from multiple areas in each town, each city, well, really each region, each state, and they would create sub schools, more like academies of a campus structure for them because there would be a few reading grades, a few reading levels above their actual grade. Mathematically, it would be the same. Reading comprehension, it would be the same. They would be a cut above the rest of their class, above the rest of their kids, and even to the point above the rest of their school. And these kids were magnetized to a program that was created for them called Classical Magnet. I was one of these uh, test subjects, so to speak. I was one of the the pilot children where they started this in uh, our particular area. So with this, eventually years and years later, and by this time I was already an adult, the kids started wearing uniforms. But before the uniforms, they also had a group that would study, you know, almost like like men in black, but not really. They would just camouflage with the crowd and they would study us in different facets because a lot of us were spread out amongst different sciences. Like I was in a computer camp, a basketball camp, a classical band, a jazz band. I mean, they had, I was basically in everything, uh, not everything, but enough different things to be studied by different groups of people. Uh, many of them being master masons. And I didn't find this out until I was an adult that we had been watched over by a group of people um, that we didn't know was there. And we couldn't even feel them. We couldn't even feel the, if there was a gang stalking thing, we couldn't even feel it. We wouldn't even notice. We were just kids too busy riding our bikes. And running wild off sugar, etc. And focused on the cute girls in class and whose sneakers and who's, you know, all of that kind of stuff. We was really, really into that. You know, really into that. So when the uniforms came, you started to see this, this factory setting of the educational system. And I think to an extent, you know, it may or may not have helped. Because with all of these different academies now, you just hear nothing but horror stories. It's not like when I was growing up, the kids was just bad, you know, if the teachers was getting called. So, and then, well, you know, you had your rare, you had your rare instances where you had me, somebody in class who would just stare off into space or take naps, you know, to the point where the teacher, the teachers used to call my mother at the job. Your son's not interested. Your son's not really engaging in the class. And she would be like, well, is he causing any problems? They'd be like, no. Is he getting his work done? She said, yes, always before everybody else. And she says, well, what do you want me to do about it? It's not my fault that he's ahead of the rest of the kids because I was getting straight A's. So that was a rare instance. But again, that was studied. And probably to this day, I'm probably still being watched, you know, for for whatever reason I'm being watched for is okay. I mean, I'm being watched on here. So that's fine. You know, I just grew comfortable with the, with the spotlight very, very early because before I even understood the spotlight, I was in the spotlight. One of my earliest memories of childhood is literally being in a spotlight, being on a stage and not having any idea what my talent was. That's how early the spotlight was on me. I was just staring at the, at the, I guess I was trying to see, the crowd from the stage or just frozen. I think the teacher might have been a talent show or something. You know, the teacher had to finally like just hurry me along. I was one of those kids like that, you know, in the neighborhood. I wasn't, I guess. But on the stage, I was I was confused. Everybody was trying to be something. Everybody seemed like they had their own get up. And so things were very ununiform, very ununiform. This is a uniform. I try to wear this constantly, you know, you wash it two, three, four times a week, whatever the case, I try to wear this because this is my uniform, but my school is different. It's a Vanta Black Chats school. 
It's a middle pillar school. It's a left hand path school. But this is connected to my tribal identity. That's connected with my uh, with my patriarch, my patriarchal side of the family and matriarchal side. It's a homage to my Native American origins because we only go back maybe two or three generations before we have a before we have a pure a purebred. That sounds I know that but for the sake of example, let's just say a purebred, a 100 percent Indian was like my great great grandmother type thing. You know, however many generations that is, that's like four, I guess four. But either way, you know, we have pictures of all the Indian gear, all of the, you know, a hundred deer knives and garments and natural hair going down to the woman's ankle. And, you know, this is my grandfather's mother. You know what I mean? So that's not that far back. And she's a hundred percent. And she was an Eastern star. With immunity in both Africa and America at the time. So she had she had diplomatic immunity uh, back in, you know, back in her day. And she had a uniform, but she created her uniform. So the power of the uniform is for uniformity. You as a people, we were taught to kind of look at uh, Jesus as being the uniform of God, just like Islam can look at uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as a uniform for the supreme being, uh, the beneficent one, the benevolent one, the titles that they refer to God as, and and so forth, so forth, and so on. Each group, each sect, religion, belief, they all have some sort of costume or some, some sort of get up that really defines them. And this is uh, and why I'm saying all of this is because you are you're not only what you eat. You know, they say we are what we eat, but not not only that, you are what you wear. You are what you wear, your energy signature, too. You have different translations of scriptures that say, let love be your all purpose garment. Let love be your all purpose garment. Whatever season you in, whatever, whatever flow you have to take, whatever's going on in your life, you want love to be your all purpose garment. You know, love is more flexible, too. It's not just a uh, it's not just a romantic comedy type of thing. Love is uh, is, is complex. You know, you can have love in a hateful situation. You can love the fact that. You have enough reserve and have enough resolve to change your situation, change your reality. You can love the fact that you hate procrastination. You can love the reality of that. So love is very flexible like that. You don't have to just define it in the Eros way between, uh, you know, between the partners in a physical intimacy type of thing. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be limited to that. Let love be your uniform. Let wisdom, intelligence, let it be your uniform. What is a uniform? It's your one form, your main form. What is your main form? What is your main form? If you're not careful, you'll be sifting through this life still looking for a form. And then in the next life, you won't you'll still be looking for a form. You'll be trapped in 4D looking for a form. Looking for a form. Trying to speak to your loved ones in 3D, but they can't see you, hear you. Occasionally they can feel you. But is due to the uniform. The uniform is what makes you uniquely you. Might your uniform is your signature. Might be the way you talk, might be the way you walk, might be the way, uh, might be the way you dress. Things of this, things of this sort all uh, contribute to your uniformity. So what do you if, if there was one thing that could be said about you, what would you want that to be? Because that is ultimately the garments that your soul puts on. 